Hello and welcome to this Electrical Principles training video. In this video we're going to continue considering the subject of AC theory and in particular we're going to start focusing on the subject of power factor. Now you'll notice on the board behind me there's an awful lot of maths spread out and things that we've been talking about over the past three or four videos. Now some of that information is going to be really important in helping us to understand the more complex parts of power factor that we'll come on to a little bit later. But for starters, let's just think about this term power factor. What is it? Well, to put it simply, power factor is basically a bad thing that happens inside AC circuits. It's caused, generally speaking, by inductive loads. So that's things like motors, transformers, anything that has a coil of wire in it that's connected to an AC supply. The bad thing that power factor is describing is the fact that inductive loads, and it is generally inductive loads that cause this to happen, inductive loads cause voltage and current inside an AC circuit to fall out of phase with each other. Up here we have a drawing of our fluorescent light circuit that we did an experiment on many videos ago. And you can see here that we've got a resistive load and an inductive load connected to each other. This could also represent just what's happening inside the coil of a motor. So the coil of the motor can be broken into two parts, the resistive part, which is the copper wire that makes the coil up, and the inductive part, which is caused by wrapping that copper conductor into a coil. Now the inductive part of the circuit causes the voltage and the current to fall out of phase with each other. And when you look at the combination of the two elements of the inductive load, you can see here we end up with this situation where current and voltage are no longer in phase with each other. We can see here that the current flowing into the circuit is lagging the voltage that is being applied to the circuit. So they, in other words, if you would think of this as a waveform, the current is rising and falling a little bit after the voltage is rising and falling. So why is that such a bad thing? Well, if you think back to other videos in this series, we saw that if uh, the current is left in this lagging position, we're actually using more current than we need to in order to power the circuit. Why is that a bad thing? Well, again, if we work our way back through the videos and we think about our power triangle, we saw that this line here represented the amount of power that the circuit was using as a total. And you can see here that the bigger this angle gets, the bigger this angle is going to get. And if this angle gets bigger and bigger and bigger, this side gets longer and longer and longer. And the consequence of that is that we end up drawing more and more current into the circuit. And because we draw more current into the circuit, the electricity companies charge us more for the electricity that we use. Now, not only do they charge us a bit more because we're using more power, but because if you have a very large installation and you're drawing an awful lot of power from that installation, and that installation has a poor power factor, that means that your installation is physically pulling more current into the building than it needs to. Now, because of that, the electricity company has to provide bigger transformers, bigger cutouts, bigger switch equipment, bigger cables to feed your installation. And because of that, they don't just charge you because you're using more power, but they charge you because you're using more current than you need to. You are placing strain on the electrical infrastructure feeding your building. And that becomes costly to the electricity provider. And therefore, they fine you for it. They will actually charge you more money. So it's very much within our interests to try and get the current and the voltage to fall back into phase with each other, to make sure, again, if we think of them as a wave diagram, that they are rising and falling in perfect synchronization with each other as much as we possibly can. So that's the simple explanation of power factor. It's a bad thing that happens. It's normally caused by inductive loads. It causes voltage and current to fall out of phase with each other. And when that happens, we draw more current into the building than we need to. And this results in us paying higher bills for our electricity. But what we can do is we can actually start to quantify power factor. We can actually start to put a number on it. We can measure what the value of power factor will be. How do we do that? Well, remember we said that power factor is an indication of how far out of phase voltage and current are. 
Now we can represent that instead of using an angle between the voltage and the current, we can use uh, a different method of doing that and that different method is the power factor. So how do we calculate it? Where does it come from? Well let's have a look at this. We've got here three different triangles that all describe what's happening inside our fluorescent light fitting. And what we're seeing is that in every case, this angle, this angle, and this angle are all exactly the same. And those three angles are the same as this angle, which is how far the current is lagging the voltage. Now what we can do is we can start to get an indication of how far it's lagging by performing some very simple calculations. And what we do is basically we take uh, this side of the voltage triangle, VR, and we divide it by VT. So let's start to put that down in writing. I'm going to pop it down here. So we can say that the power factor will be equal to the VR, this side of the triangle, divided by VT, that side of the triangle. So the resistive voltage divided by the total voltage. So we could actually calculate what the uh, power factor of our fluorescent light actually was. However, because these triangles are all in proportion with each other, actually we can calculate the power factor in other ways. So we could say the power factor is equal to the resistance of the circuit divided by the impedance of the circuit. So we could say that the power factor is also equal to resistance divided by impedance. And that will also give us our power factor. We could even use this triangle. And again, we just use this side, we could say it's equal to the true power in watts divided by the apparent power in volt amperes. So let's put that down. We've got the true power in watts divided by the volt amperes, divided by the apparent power. So power factor is also equal to true power over apparent power. Now what's interesting about each one of these is that actually for each triangle, we've taken the same side and divided it by the same side. We've taken this uh, bottom side here and divided it by the long side up here. Now because we're always gonna have a smaller number here divided by a large number, that means that our power factor is always going to be a number somewhere between zero and one. Now that's a very important kind of clue to help you with your exam questions. Power factor is always a value between 0 and 1. If you ever get a power factor that is over 1, then you've done something wrong with your calculations. So if you get an exam question that's multiple choice, and only one of the values for power factor is between 0 and 1, that's the 1. So we can start to eliminate wrong answers quite easily. However, what we can also do is we can start to bring a little bit of trigonometry into this now. So if we look at our triangles here, here's the angle that we're interested in, remembering that that represents how far out of phase the voltage and current are. So in trigonometry, this side has a special name. It is next to the angle that we're interested in, and therefore we can call this side the adjacent. So this is the adjacent side the adjacent. So this side is the adjacent. This side is also the adjacent, and this side is also the adjacent. This long side here is what we call in trigonometry the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse, the, ro the, the long side of the right angle triangle. So every time we do a calculation to find the power factor of a circuit or a load, we are taking the adjacent side and we're dividing it by the hypotenuse. Look here, we've got the adjacent R, that side, divided by the impedance Z, the hypotenuse. So we've got the side next to the angle divided by the long side of the angle. So that's what we're looking at there. So what that means is that every single time we do this, we are saying that we are doing the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse. So the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse. Now, in trigonometry, if you take the adjacent of a right angle triangle and divide it by the hypotenuse of that triangle, you come up with one of the three trigonometric identities. And of course, we know that the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse, if you think back to your school days and you think so, ka, toa, that you've got the ka bit in the middle, which means the cosine of theta is equal to the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse. What we're actually doing here is every time we're finding the cosine of the angle theta. And here's our angle theta. So can you see, if we kind of work our way along here, we can see that the power factor is equal to the cosine of theta. 
and the cosine of theta, theta is the angle that the current and the voltage are out of phase by. So that is why that angle, which is the same as that angle, that angle, and that angle, are all so important. Because the cosine of that angle tells us what the power factor is. Now, if you get your calculator and you type in what is the cosine of zero, it will spit the answer back as being one. So that means that when the angle between the voltage and the current is zero, is nothing, then that means that the power factor is one. And that is the best power factor that you can hope for. So a power factor of one means that the current and voltage are perfectly in phase and there is no leading or lagging element in your circuit. Likewise, if it were possible for the voltage and current to fall completely out of phase with each other to 90 degrees, so in other words, for this to become a purely inductive circuit, then you would have a power factor of zero because the cosine of 90 is zero. So that would be the worst possible power factor that could exist. So there we can see how as the voltage and the current fall out of phase with each other, it makes the power factor get gradually worse and worse. How do we bring them back into phase in an inductive circuit? Well, if you remember in a previous video in this series, we saw what happened when you connected a capacitor into the circuit. The capacitor generates uh, inductive reactants, but it generates inductive reactants that works in the opposite direction to the inductive reactants caused by the inductor. And that causes this side of the triangle to get smaller and smaller and smaller, which means that ultimately the voltage and the current are coming back into phase with each other. And when the voltage and current come back into phase with each other, we have corrected the poor power factor. And that's where that expression power factor correction capacitor comes from. So hopefully from this video, you started to develop your understanding of power factor. Again, that simple explanation, power factor is a bad thing. It is generally caused by inductive loads, and it means that the voltage and the current are falling out of phase with each other. That causes the circuit to use more current than it needs to, and that means that your energy bills will be higher, and that your electricity bill will also include uh, fines by the energy company for the extra current that you're drawing. However, the good news is that the power factor can be corrected by installing a capacitor into the circuit, which will bring the voltage and current back into phase with each other and getting our power factor closer to one. What we're going to do in future videos is we're gonna take all of the information that we've looked at in the previous videos and we're going to analyze a coil. We're going to measure some very basic things about it, just voltage and current, and from that, we are gonna be able to calculate many, many more complicated things regarding that coil, including its inductive reactants, its power factor, its phase angle, how far the voltage and current are out of phase with each other, and lots of other things as well. So for this video, all that remains to say is, thank you very much for watching.